That's correct. But it, and a report is basically a supplement. You, you call it a supplement, right? Correct. Okay, a supplement is basically a police report that kind of details the facts. Correct. Okay. Um, and you were able to review the supplement in this case before testifying? Yes, it was. And have there been any changes to that that you think are important to tell the, the jury and the court? Not on my supplement, no, sir. Okay. Um, then let's just start talking about the events of uh, January 14, 2009. Uh, you were on duty, correct? Yes, I was. Um, and you said you responded to a call from dispatch? Correct. And you were the first one on the scene? Yeah, I was, yes. Um, what, do you remember what they told you, dispatch, uh, exactly? I don't remember exactly what they were telling me, but it was a, a female caller asking for help with a some kind of domestic issue between her and her husband. Okay, and you were, you said you were basically just minutes away. Well, or do you know? I don't remember exactly what the response time was, but as soon as I got there, it was within the minutes that the other officers were arriving. Oh, okay. yeah, I, I, I apologize. Yeah. I mean, once the call was made, you, you responded almost immediately. Correct, yes. Yeah, so, yes. Um, and um, dispatch basically told you about the about the situation, a little bit about the situation before you mentioned. From what we were able to gather, if I do remember right, the call, the 911 call was disconnected a couple times. No, 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 <coughs> Judge, 911 calls are not just in nature. Okay. Or it's going to allow it at this point in time. Show why you did what at this point in time. You had mentioned that the calls were disconnected. Correct, yes. Um, and um, but, but they, they told you, gave you some basic facts about what you were walking into. Uh, from what they can gather, yeah, because of the disconnection, I don't, they were not able to grab okay. really a lot of information. Okay. Did they describe it as a domestic violence um, situation that you might be entering? I don't know what kind yeah, of call. Your Honor, you said. Officer, were these, uh, how did you know about the 911 calls? Were you getting it indirectly or directly from dispatch? I got it directly, sir, through the radio and through our NBC, which are our computers and our cars. So you were listening to the calls as they were coming in? Yes, sir. Your objections overruled. Okay. As opposed to his state of mind as he entered the scene. Thank you. Um, and eventually you got onto the scene. Correct, yes. And uh, what did you see when you first got there? Uh, again, it was pitch black, parked down the street, blacked out, walked out on foot. It was the initial screaming, the yelling that I heard, and then uh, when I approached the uh, driveway, like I said, I saw the door open and I saw the, the female come out of the front door. Okay, so you actually saw the, the front door open? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <coughs> uh, and then you saw a female come out? And then, yes. Did that female happen to be uh, Marissa? Oh, yes, it was. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, you. You said it was dark. Did you have any kind of light on you that I had a I have a flashlight on, yes. So and you, you were using the flash? Yes, I was. Um, what, what can you tell me, can you tell me a little bit about uh, her disposition at that time? Uh, very hysterical and really hard to understand. Was she, she, was, was she trying to talk? Uh, she was mainly coming out screaming and yelling and I was trying to calm her down and get any kind of coherent statement out of her to figure out what was going on. And then, like I said, at that point, I noticed the blood. That's what directed my line of questioning to if she was injured and where the blood came from. Okay. And then you established that uh, she, she told you she told you that uh, it was her husband's blood once you asked. That is correct, yes. Uh, and you used your flashlight to see that, to see that there the was fresh blood. Yes, sir. And the blood was fresh, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, you had also mentioned that uh, she, you tried to calm her down, but it was, it was very difficult. That's correct, yes. Um, and, you had mentioned in the direct examination that she threw the phone down on the ground at some point. Do you, do you remember what point that she did that? It was during the conversation when I was trying to figure out what uh, what was going on, and it was somewhere between the questioning of whether it was her blood or where the blood came from. What, was it was it early on? It, it was a very brief encounter. Okay. So yeah. I I can't give you an exact time frame, but it was very brief. Um, because as soon as I noticed the blood, and as soon as she told me that it was her husband's blood. I again called the fire department and then kind of expedited my wanting to find the subject who was bleeding to make sure he didn't die. Right. Okay. Um, you, you said it was odd that she threw the phone down the ground. Yes. Sir. Uh, but you did mention that the dispatch, that 
it was disconnected a few times. Right. It, yes, whether that was the same line she was calling, I'm, I'm not sure. Okay, great. Fair enough. Um, at some point you said you saw a black male come out of the house? Yes, sir. Okay, and what did you do at that point? I told him to stop where he was because he walked out of the house with his hands in his pockets. Again, not knowing what was going on, I gave him an order to stop, take his hands out of his pockets, he complied. Sorry. And then uh, Officer Nolenbush went up and contacted that subject. Okay, and so, so you really didn't have any other contact with, with that person? Uh, not direct contact, just the verbal order for him to stop and take his hands okay. out. Okay, and, and then Officer Dornbush is the one that, that basically took him onto the side. Correct. Okay. Yes, sir. Um, did you find out who that person was? I found out through Officer Dornbush that that was Stanley Cook. Okay, and, and what did he say about Stanley? He told me that Stanley. Sustained counsel. Okay. Um, you, uh, let's see. You said at some point you realized somebody in the house could have been, would have been severely injured. Correct. So, so at that point you had to turn your focus to the, the person in the house. Correct. Um, what, what, what happened with Marissa? Did you just kind of... At that point also Officer Cobbett arrived on scene and I asked Officer Cobbett to stand by with Marissa. As I went over to Officer Gomez, who was with Stanley, and then we ultimately went in the house with uh, Sergeant Bondar. Okay, um, at some point you came into the, the master bedroom, and as we saw in the, in the picture, you saw it there. Correct. And he was lying on the ground. And that, but the, the pictures that, that we have, or that were at, at your reflections of what you remember. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, uh, he, he was completely new. Yes. Didn't have a stitch of clothing. No. Okay. Um, and you, the, the bed was covered in blood. Correct. Okay. Um, and you basically provided first aid. Yes. Okay, at what point did you, while you were providing first aid, did you notice the hammer? When I was leaving the bedroom. And do you remember about how many minutes that, that would have been? It, no, but it was minutes. It was not okay. a long period of time since, like I said, we already had fire there, and it was just a right. matter of telling them it was okay to enter. Okay. Um, do you remember how far the hammer was from his body? I don't. You saw it? No, I'm sorry. Okay, can you give us an estimation? I can't give you an estimation. The feet, it was a master bedroom. You know, almost a master bedroom. So it was within, within the bedroom? Correct, okay. yes. And yes. The bedroom is maybe 10 by 12 or something. Whatever. Maybe within that. Directly by the front door to wherever the okay. bed was from. That. Okay. Um, and you also mentioned that you had accompanied Dale to the hospital, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and you said he was speaking at the time when, when he was. He was trying to speak again. It was moaning and some girl okay. trying to get some information out. It took quite a while to understand even the request to move his leg. And that was really the only information I could get. He just said he wanted to move his leg or remove his leg. I to have his leg moved. To get his, his yeah, because he was strapped down on the gurney to, re to restrict his I movement see. based on his injuries. Okay, could you tell if he was conscious at that point or not? Okay. He was moving and trying to talk. If that's conscious, then yes, but I don't think he was very uh, okay. hearing what was going on, at least okay. from what I can tell, but again, I'm not right. training on that one. Well, fair enough. Um, so, so he was, he had a level of awareness. Correct. Here. Okay. Um, but he wasn't really making that much sense to you? Or? No, he was not. Uh, and here again, you, you stayed at the hospital until after the surgery had taken place? Correct. Um, and did you ever interview uh, Dale Van? No, the vast majority of the time he was at the hospital, he was sedated and out by the medical staff, and he was out until I was uh, relieved by Detective Timmons, who showed up at the hospital later on that day. Okay, uh, no further questions. Thank you, Kevin. Redirect. The officer churchman, you had indicated the defense attorney uh, said that you had him stand by for Marissa. Do you know the woman's name at the time? I did not. Officer Collard was the one who actually ended up identifying who she was. Do you see the person who was there that night in the courtroom today? I do. She's seated over to my left wearing a black jacket, like a tan on her top. You know what I mean? The record the witness to identify the Good well. Now, Officer Churchman, I don't know if it's a choice of wording, but I got a little confused about the condition of the front door when you got there. Was the front door when you got there open or closed? The front door was open. 
So you didn't actually see the door opening. The door was open when you got there. Yeah, yeah, it was already open when I got there. But nobody was outside at that point that you saw? No, nobody. I have no further questions. At this point, uh, if any juror has a question for this witness, please raise your hand and then write out the question. I don't see any hands, so it looks like you're free to go, sir. Thank you. Your Honor, we'd ask him to be subject to recall. He'll be subject to recall. Your Honor, stage next witness will be Officer Dornbush. While he's getting the witness, if you have questions, you can write them down while the lawyers are asking them. But at the end, I'll do the same thing. I'll ask whether anybody has any questions. Someone does. You don't have to have it already written out. All you have to do is let me know that you have a question. I'll give you a moment to write it out. I meet with the lawyers at the side of the bench. We look at it, and then uh, it calls for evidence that's admissible. Then we will ask the question for that witness. Some witnesses we can get back. Police officers are never difficult. However, when we get to the civilian witnesses, once I release them, they're gone. So keep that in mind. Sometimes I get from the jury a question saying, can you call back that witness that we had two weeks ago and have them re-explain something to us? And I have to say, sorry, no. So um, that's how it will work. Thank you, come on up, officer. Mr. Cook, uh, as 
he was standing near the resident. I had asked him a question, and that question was, are you injured? Anybody injured? He said no. What did you do with that? I asked him if he had any weapons on his person, which he stated he did, and he also made some uh, body movements. Can you describe those body movements, did you? Sure. The body movements Mr. Cook made was he had raised his hands above his head. He had looked downwards towards his right front pants pocket, and then he had made the statement of yes to the question. <laughs> Based on that answer, what did you do? I asked him to turn around, which he complied. Subject turned around. Mr. Cook did. He maintained his hands above his head. He placed his hands on the back side of his head, interlocked his fingers. And at that time, I conducted a pat down based on the fact he stated he had a weapon. Pat down of his person. And what do you mean by a pat down of his person? I started with the waist area. I I maintained, uh, basically what I did was I had taken my left hand and I placed it on top of his hands, which were on the back side of his head. I started with my right hand. I checked the waist area to make sure that there was no weapons in the waist area of his person. And then I checked the right side of his body, which uh, consisted of a pocket of his pants. And what happened at that point? I located an object inside the pocket, which, based on my training experience, uh, I believed that that object that I was feeling was a gun. Now, once you felt what you believed to be a gun, what did you do? I placed my hand inside the pocket and removed the gun. Can you describe to the jury what that gun looked like? It was a smaller size handgun. Uh, it appeared to be a semi-automatic pistol. And ultimately, what did you do with that gun? After I retrieved it, I placed it in my pants pocket, uh, a cargo pocket, which was on the side of my pants, which I'm wearing today. Pants similar to what I was wearing that night. So once you had control of that gun, um, did you later do something else with that gun? I turned it over to an additional officer who responded after I located that specific gun. And which officer was that? That was Officer Clint Cobbett. <coughs> Once you turned over the gun to Officer Cobbett, did you have any more dealings with that gun? So now Mr. Cook has come outside, he's removed this gun from his person. What did he do with that one? After the gun was removed, the gun was turned over to Officer Cobbett, Sergeant Mondrag, and myself, and Officer Churchman, entered the residence. Can you describe to the jury uh, that problem? Sergeant Mondragon, uh, he obtained a, a safety shield. He entered the residence through the front door. Officer Churchman and I followed him. Upon entry, we uh, focused our attention to the left of the front door, which would be in the eastern direction. We walked in the eastern direction, and at that point, I heard a sound within the residence. The sound appeared to be coming from the opposite direction where we were, which would be west of the front door. So what did you do as you heard that sound? I made the statement. I think I, well, I informed Officer Churchman and Sergeant Mondragon that I'm hearing a sound to the west. I made a statement such as maybe I think he's over in this direction. So what did you, what did you guys do at that point? We focused our direction of travel from the east now to the west of where I was hearing that sound. And where did you go in the residence? Uh, we walked past the front entryway into uh, continued westbound into a hallway and eventually into a master bedroom. And once you get into the master bedroom, what do you see? Once we entered the master bedroom, I observed a room that was furnished with typical bedroom furnishings. Uh, once I passed the thresh, thresh of the door to my left, I observed a new male subject laying on the floor. Now, where exactly did you see the male subject on? The 
if you're standing at the foot of the bed and you're looking at the bed, you would be on the left side of the bed. Can you describe this male subject to the jury? The male subject uh, was a white male subject, appeared to have dark color hair. Uh, I would estimate his weight probably anywhere between 150 to 160. And how is this male positioned on the floor? He was laying with his stomach side on the floor, so the back of his body was visible. Uh, the head of this individual was propped up against a nightstand, and his face was turned towards the bed of that the bed that was located in that room. Now you said his head was propped up against the nightstand. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that was his body was laying, um, the top portion of his head would be at the nightstand, but when I first entered the room, I observed his head kind of, the uh, best way to describe it was the side, side of his face was pressed up against uh, the nightstand. His face, face was looking towards the bed. Does that make sense? And what was this man doing in the beginning to the He was lying there and he appeared to be making sounds consistent of moaning. What did you ever do at this point? I was instructed at that point, once we observed uh, the subject and observed the interior portion of that room, I was instructed by Sergeant Mondragon to uh, retrieve a digital camera. So at that point, I left the bedroom, left the residence, went out to the street, which is Maplewood Street, to where my car was parked and obtained a camera. Now, this going out to get the camera, about how long did that take? I would say an estimated 30 seconds, not very long. You take your camera, it was, it, what do you do at that point? Once I got my camera, I already knew that the firefighters and the paramedics were there. They had just arrived. Um, I got my camera and I went back into the residence, back into that specific bedroom, and started taking pictures. Now when you began taking pictures, uh, did the fire department and the paramedics already into that room or were they still outside? When I, when I started taking the initial pictures, the first picture, they had not entered, uh, they had not entered that bedroom. Sometime during your taking of those photos, did the fire department enter? Yes. After the fire department uh, arrived on the scene, what happened at that point? I continued to take photographs while they were inside there, while they were assessing the subject. Uh, they quickly assessed the subject, the male subject that was laying on the ground, and ultimately they removed him from that room, transported him to the hospital. And did you remain there at the scene? Yes, I did. And about how long did you remain there? I believe I left, I would say probably at 6.30 in the morning. So a few hours? Yes. Now going back to these pictures that you uh, took, what were you focusing your, your attention on or what was your goal in taking these photos? My goal of taking the photos, first of all, uh, the location of this male subject where he was located at, uh, the surrounding furniture that was next to him, surrounding objects that were next to him, and also uh, what appeared to be blood. Now you mentioned objects surrounding uh, this male. Was there an object in particular that you were concerned with? Right next to the door of the bedroom, there was a small, uh, I would say, table or desk. On top of that table or desk item was a hammer. And you have permission to publish Exhibit 20 through 24? Counsel, if there is any evidence, you don't need my permission. Just go ahead and do it. Out of courtesy, they asked me to publish, but if we're going to go through all these exhibits, folks, uh, 
once they're in evidence, they can publish them, and uh, we won't have to have this formality uh, on that. So, go ahead. Good afternoon. Um, 
you and you said you at some point you also saw the camera. Yes. Okay. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? How far was the hammer from Dale itself? When you observed it? It was, it was probably within a foot and a half. Okay, so it was right there. It, it was in close proximity. Okay. Proximity. And okay. at some point, Officer Churchman was rendering aid and trying to trying to uh, stop the bleeding uh, on Dale. And you said you. I'm sorry. You went out uh, to your car and you, you, you got your, your, your camera. Correct. And you started taking photos. Yes. Well, why did you do that? Why did I retrieve the camera? Yeah, well, well, yeah why, why, what would be a good reason for you to go out to the car, get your, your camera, and then come back and start documenting the scene? First of all, my team sergeant, my sergeant at the time, was present. Okay. And he had asked me to go get the camera. He is my sergeant. I'm going to do what he tells me. Second of all, makes sense to po possibly preserve evidence. Mm -hmm. So you are you already looking at this as a potential crime scene? Yes. Okay. Um, and then at some point you said that they the the, the fire department came in and they started responding and, and treating Dale, correct? Yes. And they took him out and Officer Churchman had gone with him to, your, to the best of your knowledge. Right? Correct. Okay. Um, but you said you stayed at the house until 6.30. Yes. Uh, what, what were you doing at that time? After the subject had already left to the yeah. hospital. <coughs> After Dale had already left. I remained inside the home. Uh, I knew that there were additional subjects inside the home. And also to uh, potentially, which ultimately I did brief the detectives. So you were able to brief the detectives and you said there were other subjects in the home. Who were those subjects? I found out during the course of this investigation they were the children. Okay. And um, were you able to talk with them at all? Children? I spoke to the oldest of three. Okay. Um, and then um, it, at some point, did you remove the girls from the residence? I did was not. Another, was that another option? Another officer. Okay. Um, and also, it's my understanding that you generated a crime scene law. Yes, I did. And what, what is that? What is a crime? Crime scene. Kind of a crime scene law is is documentation of where the incident is located at, uh, the dates, the times. If there's a report number generated for that specific incident. The report number will be documented on that, and also who enters the area that we have determined is the crime scene, and who also exits. So if you enter, you get documented on the crime scene at the time you enter, and if you leave, you also get documented at the time that you do leave. Okay, and then why, why do you do that? Why do you do yeah, that? Yeah, why, why would you do uh, Why would you keep a crime law? Just, crime to, just to document who was in that vicinity. Okay. Um, fair enough. Um, I, okay. Thank you, officer. No Thank you. Read the record, please. Officer, you mentioned that you were initially outside the home uh, with officer Churchman and Sergeant Margaret and eventually went to the home. About how long were you all outside the house before you decided to enter? From the time that we got there? Yes. From the time we entered? I would I didn't document that in my report, but to the best of my recollection at this point, I would say maybe within five minutes. Thank you. No further questions. Any questions by the jury? Write it out, please.
Sam Cook or Stan Cook going to testify? Yes, sir. Okay. The question is, is why did Stan have a gun? Mr. Cook's going to testify. You can re-ask that question one or the other. A juror is requesting a two-scale version of Exhibit 19. Folks, it is what it is. See from the date of the crime, we're now into 2014, and the work was all done back in 2009. The exhibits are what they are, and we're not going to go back and reinvestigate and come up with other things. So, as you can see, some of the pictures were blurry, but again, they are what they are, and you may get other pictures from other people later on. Is it customary to put a crime scene, a crime scene evidence in your pocket? It depends on the situation. Can you describe why you did it already? At the specific time, there were two officers on scene. First of which, Officer Churchman. Second, myself. I didn't have the knowledge of if there were any additional people outside of the residence or inside at the time. Um, and like I said, I did not know if he had another weapon on his purse, and that was the first one that I found. When I found that weapon, I still had not checked the left side of his uh, purse, left side of his body. There was no safe place at that time for me to secure that weapon other than the fact I stated I placed it in my pocket. The reason being is because it was just myself and Officer Churchman there, and that was the securest place that I could put it to where the situation occurred. That individual could not get to that weapon and obtain it. When you approached Stanley Cook, was there any blood on his person? I did not see any. But again, it was dark at that time. When you saw the hammer, was it straight or crooked on the stand by the door? The first picture that you observed of the hammer was the way that I observed it initially. Can you show the first picture of the hammer to the officer? So when you first saw it, that was how it was placed on the table? Yes, sir. And the second picture, someone had apparently moved it? Who that specific person is, I don't know. Uh, just as we discussed, there were several firefighters and paramedics who had entered, entered that area and assessed Mr. Harrell before that specific photograph there was taken. So the firefighters came in and 
Officer Churchman was withdrawing. They were trying to get down to render assistance. So there's a lot of people in a small area. That's correct. Any questions based upon the jury questions or the court's follow-up question? No, thank you. Okay, you're free to leave, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Sydney, we're going to take the afternoon break. getting started and everybody's getting warmed up here and might be we need to um, just get into our stride a little bit but um, I just wanted to point out we don't have to now the third witness the sergeant who was there redescribe exactly what we've had so far one way or the other but again I might be hypercritical I'm not ordering you not to um, just a gentle suggestion to when we can keep things moving um, one way or the other. Anything else before we take the break? If the parties have stipulated to that exhibit being admitted. Officer, could you please introduce yourself to the jury? That's Ryan Churchman, Joe Close Department. How long have you been in office? About eight and a half years now. If you pull the microphone just a little closer, I'm in one of the old courtrooms. They're not quite as... Okay. It gets a little intimidating being right in your face, but it's a little better. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. Officer Churchman, were you on duty the day of January 14, 2009, at about 2.45 in the morning? I was. On that day, about that time, did you respond to a 911 call from the residents of 2149 East Maplewood Street, Gilbert? Yes. Is that within Maricopa County? Yes. Were you the first to arrive at that residence regarding that call? I was. When you got there, what did you see? Uh, when I got there, I parked down the street uh, further to the east, blacked out, and walked up on foot. First uh, of anything I had was I heard a female voice screaming. I couldn't tell exactly what was being said, but I could hear a female voice screaming. At that point in time, did you see the woman? I did not. I walked up towards the uh, address that we just spoke about, and when I walked up, 